Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Dave Petrillo with us. Dave, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so, Dave, you're the co-creator of Coffee Julie's. Am I saying that right? You are, yeah. All right. Um, uh, first, tell us, uh, what is Coffee Julie's? Because you have a really interesting story that we'll get into, but let's just start with what is it? Sure, yeah. Okay, so Coffee Julie's are little stainless steel coffee beans. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, I can see it perfect. Okay, so like they're about half the size of a chicken egg, and you I sell five of them, and what they do is they keep your coffee the right temperature. So you take uh, a couple of them, you put them into a coffee mug, and when you pour in coffee that's too hot to drink, it cools it down to the perfect temperature uh, faster than it would cool it down, and then it actually keeps it at the right drinking temperature for a little bit longer than it would stay normally. Okay, so it's not really a heating or a cooling device. It's both based on what you need at that time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like it, it, it just tries to maintain it at the right drinking temperature for longer because coffee is always like a little bit too hot or it's a little bit too cold and you never get that, that yeah. window of opportunity. We sell some cups that give a, that give you like that window of opportunity for hours and hours and hours more than you could ever want. So, gotcha. so you actually sell, sell the, the, the bean looking metal things that do the magic and you sell the, the coffee mug to kind of make it last as long as possible. Yeah, we actually just picked out our favorite coffee mug and we sell it alongside of our product. But this is the only thing that we we invented manufacturing. So. Gotcha. That's cool. Um, so now tell us, how did you raise the money to actually create this product? Because um, that, that's an interesting story in and of itself. Yeah, for sure. So uh, this product was started by me and a friend of mine, my co-founder, um, also named Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, we were childhood friends and we started... Uh, working on this idea kind of as a hobby. So we set a certain amount of money aside that was just, you know, from our savings. And we said if we can if we can get um, a prototype made and a and a product made for this amount of money such that we can get a real customer feedback, then, you know, that'll you'll consider that a success. By the time we're finished, you know, tooling around with this little thing um, if we have something that's good enough to sell to somebody and, 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 and reasonably take their money in exchange for it, that's a success. So we set aside uh, 5000 bucks to do that. And um, we actually, by the time we started selling jewelry, we had only spent 4000 okay. So we came in a little under budget. And um, the way we started selling them, the, the first part that we got actual customers was a uh, prototype store, friends and family. But uh, Kickstarter was the main avenue that we chose uh, to get you know wider. Uh, wider customer base, and yeah. uh, it was early 2011 when Kickstarter when we, when we went on Kickstarter. So it was still kind of um, there had only been a few projects that had raised tons of money on Kickstarter, and we raised uh, 300,000. So by the time we finished, we were the third largest project on Kickstarter. Wow, that's incredible. Well, let's actually talk about Kickstarter a little bit because we've never sure. had anybody uh, with that level of success on Kickstarter on the show. So I cool. want to kind of get into some of the details a little bit because a lot of people in the audience, they might be considering Kickstarter as an avenue yeah. to raise that money as well. Um, it's a great it's a great tool. Well, let me ask you. Um, you say it's a great tool. What made you pick that platform um, as opposed to maybe Indiegogo? I don't know if they were around back then when you were making the decision or other possibilities or maybe just angel investment or VC money. What made you really kind of gravitate toward that? Okay, so well, first to answer between Kickstarter and other crowdsourcing platforms. There weren't other reputable crowdsourcing platforms around when I was on, uh, when we were looking at um, which one to use. Uh, we okay. had seen, so, uh, Kickstarter had the most number of projects out there and they had the most data available. So um, the really cool thing about Kickstarter is that you can kind of look in and see what other companies have done in the past and what worked for some people and what didn't work for other people. And we kind of, we spent a lot of time pulling data off that website and pulling and, and studying kind of, uh, you know, what worked for other people but in order to make ours, you know, hit all the check boxes that we thought was the recipe for a successful project. Yeah. Um, so Kickstarter had the most, uh, you know, information available, you know, to that effect. So that's what we, why we chose Kickstarter. Um, and then for Kickstarter versus other uh, funding routes is uh, that's just not the style of business that we are. So we decided, hey, let's take this small amount of money and, and see if we can get to a um, get to answer the question of do people want to buy this? And mm -hmm. we we did that successfully. We got to it with four thousand dollars. And uh, if we went out, you know, 
found no customers that wanted to buy any of it, and, it, and some venture capitalists wanted to give us some money to, to keep trying to find no customers that wanted to buy it, I think that would be a stupid thing to do. So mm-hmm. we kind of, we picked a product that would be easy and affordable enough to, to do on our own, mm-hmm. specifically so that we could take the bootstrap route, kind of. I got you. So you really knew the route you wanted to take, and you had a product that would allow you to take that route. I mean, it makes sense. Um, right. You, we didn't want to like make a motorcycle or anything that would cost, you know, <laughs> I, it's uh-huh. too, too stressful. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. Uh, in my own companies, that's kind of the same way I think about things as well. Um, you talked about how you kind of looked at what was already being done on Kickstarter and learned from that data. And I want to get to that in just a second. Um, but let's back up one other step so we can really understand the whole process. Uh, what were you offering on Kickstarter? Because usually there's different levels, like level one, we give you this, we get this. <laughs> level two, you know, what were your kind of uh, value propositions on there? So it's funny that things that we offered on Kickstarter are still the only things that my, my business sells uh, okay. you know, a year and a half later. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sold a set of five coffee jewelries, and on Kickstarter it was $40, mm-hmm. which we said was a discount on the MSRP of $50, which is what these sell for now. Mm-hmm. So they're 10 bucks a piece. And then we had um, the Perfection Pack, which is one of these mugs. This is lit. This is missing a, uh, a lid, mm-hmm. but this is a, a thermos um insulated travel mug and we just buy this from Thermos and put our logo on it and resell it yeah. and just because it's the best mug that you can possibly use with these with these two with this thing mm-hmm. uh, and that was a hundred dollars on Kickstarter and then we had a wholesale pack which was uh, 20 sets of five for any coffee shops that wanted to like buy them and resell them mm-hmm. which Kickstarter has since specifically disallowed so you're not allowed to do that anymore on Kickstarter um, it's against the rules but uh, um, that that worked that worked pretty good for us so yeah. we said if we want to go on Kickstarter in order to crowdfund Coffee Julies, let's make sure we just sell Coffee Julies and not T-shirts and buttons and all this other stuff. That's just going to be a headache later on. No, it makes sense. Um, how did it work out in terms of how many people bought the wholesale as opposed to the other levels? Was it surprising or was it just like you expected only a couple people bought the wholesale? Uh, it wasn't really surprising at all. The, the, the amount of people that bought it was surprising. We didn't expect yeah. to raise nearly that money, so that was really cool. But mm-hmm. um, with download, you can do this yourself. You can download the data from our Kickstarter project and look at how many people bought at fifty dollars, how many people bought at hundred dollars, and how many people bought at five hundred dollars. Uh-huh. That's just a nice exponential decay. So what you it, you know, what you'd expect, and pretty much. Uh, this, that's the kind of numbers that I would download and, and look at for other Kickstarter projects. Um, when we were choosing how much money to charge for these things, and it was surprisingly accurate to other people's projects as how much uh, how the data came in, which is yeah. really cool. Now, this is what I'm really interested in: is this research you did on other companies on Kickstarter? Because that's really growth hacking. I mean, that's really getting into the data, seeing what the data teaches us, and then making business decisions based off of it, and not just hoping and wishing. Yeah. So, what right. did you what did you do? Like, um, you say this is publicly available. Literally, you just made it on their profile page. You just went and grabbed the numbers. Did you put it in Excel yourself? Like, walk me through that process of research because that's really interesting. Yeah, sure. So on Kickstarter, there's a few there's a few things that you get to put on your product page. And I think that one of the things that made our Kickstarter so successful is, or our our business be successful on Kickstarter is Kickstarter forces you to kind of condense all of this stuff that's going on in your head and all the stuff that's going on in this business into just one page. Mm-hmm. You get you get one video, you get to sell one, like a couple products, and then mm-hmm. you get a description. That's it. So mm-hmm. you have to you have to condense everything down so that you can share it with your friends and then they can share it with their friends. You know, before when I was working on the project, you know, I was like, oh yeah, we're doing this thing and we got this Facebook page and you know, I can give you some or whatever, but there wasn't just one central location where you can go. So, you know, every single project has that. Yeah. And um, we looked at the only dials that you can change on Kickstarter are how long is your project uh, on for? Okay. You see to raise and what you're selling, and then how you present the project to the, person, the, the, the potential backers. So some of those are numbers. We decided that 30 days was definitely the best amount of time to put the thing up for when later data has shown. If you, if you go on like Kickstarter's blog and do the data mm-hmm. like uh, tag, there's a lot of lot more of this that's that's available. Like kind of after after we had been finished with it, there's a lot of other people who are interested yeah. in the data of Kickstarter. So that's like excellent reading okay. for whoever's watching. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, 30 days we decided was the most um, important or the best uh, length of time mm-hmm. to choose. And we also decided that shooting for a small amount of money is much more likely to get you success or even a large success. Mm-hmm. Uh, and shooting for a giant amount of money 
at the time when we when we posted our project, no one who had asked for a tremendously large amount of money had ever received it in product design. So that's changed since uh, since we've been on. But I still think that if you're going to if you want a large amount of money mm -hmm. and you use Kickstarter to raise it, you should rethink what you're trying to do to see how you could make a smaller incremental step with a small amount of money. Yeah. And then shoot that. And if you get a lot more than that, then you're just pleasantly surprised. Yeah, absolutely. So you said 30 days was the right number for length. What was the right number? What did you ask for on Kickstarter? What was the amount of money you asked for? $9,500. You're breaking up there a little bit. 9500 <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nine thousand five. So thirty days. Nine thousand five hundred. Did you come to that ten k mark also by the data? You saw other companies that asked for ten k usually yeah. funded the campaign and had even more. And ten to fifteen was a sweet spot for product design. You could, you know, you could reasonably find enough friends and family and Facebook friends to to kind of get you there. And um, if you had a lot of success, you would get past that, you know, by a lot. And yeah. I think that if you're a backer or a Kickstarter person and you see this runaway project that's totally smashed its goal, you're more likely to kind of jump on the bandwagon of a successful project than you are to root for the underdog of someone who's like way far away of a goal because you're uh. kind of, at that point, you're kind of gambling with your money. So that was one of the conclusions that we made is like people are way more likely to just say, okay, if I, if I buy this now, I'll get it, you know, at some time in the future, I don't have to worry about whether it funds or not. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to shoot for this giant goal, people are like, oh, this isn't even going to work anyway, so yeah. how am I going to actually help, you know? Like, they're not as, as willing to take out their wallets and help you out. No, it makes sense. The psychology's off there. So, you know, you looked at the timeline, you looked at the amount to ask for. Were there any other variables of data that you were really looking at, uh, or was that those the main two? Well, the, t the tiers. So you get to choose how much you... Okay. So what did the data tell you about that and how um, you act on it? We, you know, we saw that uh, $20 at the time was a really great reward. So okay. you could get, you know, a lot of people are willing to give you 20 bucks in order to, to, to get in on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were looking to make this more of a high-end product at the time. So we crunched the numbers and we said, okay, it costs us this much to make it. Mm -hmm. And if we sell it for $40, we'll make this much. And if we sell it for $80, we we'll make, you know, a lot more money. But mm -hmm. uh, the, the economic... The, the math on Kickstarter said that even if we lose all that margin, which is you know a lot, to sell it forty dollars, so many more people will buy it that we'll, we'll have more success at that price than than trying to go for you know a little bit of extra margin in the product. And yeah. um, you know it's hard to say what impact that had exactly on our product, but um, like I said, it was the, the curve, the you know price elasticity curve when we downloaded it later was definitely not linear. It's you know. It's exponential. So as you lower the price, more and more and more people come, come yeah. to buy. Right. So it seems like you really uh, you you got close to not be. You weren't greedy. Um, you made sure you asked for as little as possible overall. You asked mm -hmm. for as little as possible with individual buys. Um, so really, you weren't trying to to be greedy. You were trying to have the minimum there that you could, and then kind of blow it out of the water. Uh, were there any other variables? Yeah. Do things like videos matter? Do things like the copywriting on the page matter? Um, those are traditional things that we know matter with websites. How much do you think it mattered with uh, Kickstarter, and how did it affect you guys? Uh, I, I mean, that's another thing that we looked at, but that was like more just kind of look and feel. Qualitative, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the most important thing with Kickstarter project is kind of what I was, I was hitting on before is that it's simple and easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So. On Kickstarter, you might be browsing through product projects. Someone might be sending you this link who you know, and you only, are only going to open it for five seconds. Mm -hmm. You need to capture the attention of somebody within a few seconds. And if they're going to watch your video, you want to actually get them to get go to the end. Sure. So um, it, it, we had been working on this for eight months. We had all of this crazy you know, ideas about it, all these different ways to explain it and whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have to just take a step back and make it so, so simple mm -hmm. and that you think it's just way oversimplified and that you're really not doing yourself justice in how you explain how cool it is and everything, but you really have to like uh, do a couple edits of the video and do a couple edits of the of the copy on the page because all of the people who are coming to your page are seeing it for the very first time. Yeah. So um, if you, we basically what I, I'd say to other people who are thinking about Kickstarter is make your video, get your point across. Um, Kickstarter project in the end is going to tell you whether or not your video or your idea was, was good. If, if people actually want to, you know, see your movie or buy your product, um, the only thing you can do is make sure that it's clearly explained. Mm -hmm. So when you're sharing 
your preview of your product with your friends or your preview of your Kickstarter page, mm-hmm. if they're like, I don't understand what you mean here mm-hmm. or like what this does, that's a huge problem you need to fix. Mm-hmm. If they're like, yeah, I totally get it, but I don't think it's for me. I think it's a stupid idea. Don't worry about that kind of stuff because what you're looking for is like, even if you know 10% of people think it's a great idea, that might be way, like totally enough. Yeah. But, um, you don't want to have something that's just too confusing. So uh, that was one thing that we noticed about um, other Kickstarter projects is make the video short, make it simple, get across a couple key things. One was that uh, you have the credibility and the the wherewithal to deliver on whatever it is that you say you're going to do. So you have to explain your your credibility and why you're the person to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to explain the value proposition of the product so they're actually getting something, you know, that they will be willing to pay for it yeah, you have to say want, yeah. they want yeah you're in kickstarter is not the store but you know when you're selling product design stuff there's a lot of similarities you can't ignore you can't just say i really want to do this so you should just give me a bunch of money yeah. in exchange for nothing you have to have a selling value proposition mm-hmm. then the last thing about kickstarter is um you have to basically make it clear that you can't can't proceed without kickstarter so yeah. you've done all this work come all this way and the the missing ingredient is these people to help you out. So um, we we were in that situation. We had done all this work. We had come to the prototypes, and and just like all the other product design projects on Kickstarter, um, you get to this point where you go talk to manufacturers, and they say, okay, well, in order to take you seriously, our first order is going to have to be for you know X thousand products. Mm-hmm. Um, and when a lot of people go to Kickstarter and say, okay, we've done all the prototyping and all the all you know all the testing. We just need to bring to reality now, um, and the truth is that 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 gap between for work prototype and shippable product is, mm-hmm. is really 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 big, yeah. um, and a lot of people kind of underestimate that. Yeah, no, I mean that's great actionable advice that you've given us about the the campaigns on Kickstarter and kind of how you saw it, um, and I think it's, I think it's good advice. Let me ask you this. Were there any drawbacks to raising money on Kickstarter? It almost just seems like too good to be true. Um, is there anything about it that's like really negative that you've experienced after the fact, maybe? Uh, yeah, for sure. So Kickstarter being the biggest warning uh, I can give about raising a bunch of money on Kickstarter, especially for a product design project, is that there's not really an undo button after you finish your your funding. So Uh people have given you money for something that you don't have. (laughs) (laughs) You have to deliver it no matter what. Uh uh, This puts you at an incredibly big opportunity to make the biggest mistake or the biggest miscalculation you've ever made in your whole life. Uh So um, we calculated how much it would cost us to make this product, and you were totally wrong. It Uh cost way more. That. So even um, even our like you know we you're shooting for like you don't want to be too greedy you don't want to you know make something that no one can afford and you need to have money to make it and uh, plan for contingencies and, and problems that go wrong and things that cost not the same amount as you thought they were going to cost. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you're kind of opening yourself up to a huge amount of risk there, and the bigger your project gets, mm-hmm. the that, that risk is. So um, the whole you know the whole uh, methodology time lean startups and lean product development these days says that you know going towards a bigger and bigger product is definitely the wrong way to go you want yeah. to say, okay let's make this small small step figure out like measure it make sure everything was right then do another one and do another one so uh, when i talk to other people about doing kickstarter projects that's why i say okay shoot for the smallest amount of goal like goal you can shoot for that like let's 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 get here first mm-hmm. and that product and then you know we have all these people that may you know listen to us and we can go sell some more later and just you, know, you have your contingency plan in for either when you're going to stop mm-hmm. the madness. You know, like you probably don't want to raise ten million dollars to kickstart. <laughs> I don't have people that have done that because you know maybe if they raise one and then you know they figure out all the glitches, they can sell nine million more later. But yeah. uh, you know, think about it in in terms of how much risk you're putting yourself at as yeah. your project is bigger and bigger. That makes a lot of sense. It, so it's almost like Kickstarter can end up being the opposite of lean startups. If you're not careful, if you if you overfund yourself, you're instantly a big corporation, but you haven't learned anything to actually run it efficiently. So it's almost like the worst of both worlds. Right. So that's my that's my that's my caveat for Kickstarter. But yeah. uh, you know, obviously, Kickstarter is, is fantastic way to raise money for your product without 
taking on any investment. It's, it's, it's by far the best way to come to come up with funds. Yeah. Do you think you'd use it again, kind of after seeing the good and the bad of it? I mean, would you use it again on your next project? Absolutely, I would. I, I would use Kickstarter. I, yeah. I, I probably will, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, you have to, if you, for the customers, like I said before, Kickstarter is not a store. When you buy something, you you don't you don't necessarily get it. There's risks and all that stuff. But for this person manufacturing the product, Kickstarter is definitely a store. Yeah. You have to you have to have your margins built in. You have to you know you have to make some money at the end of the day to cover everything, and you have to have all of your ducks in a row before you go and start selling something to somebody that you don't have yet. Yeah. So uh, my my caution with product design pages is to make sure that you really have figured out more than you think you. You might need to before yeah. you get the money and bring out all these new Absolutely. people. So now you raised uh, three hundred thousand on Kickstarter. Uh, was that the number you said? Three hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the first like major highlight, I think, of uh, Coffee Julie's. Um, the second one that I know of, at least, is you actually appeared on Shark Tank. Uh, it was so interesting. I actually watched the episode you were on. Um, you and I guess the other day was on it as well. And uh, so, you know, when we booked you as an interview, I was like, wait, I know that guy. Where do I know him from? And I was like, oh, yeah, he's on Shark Tank. So let me yeah. ask you, how did you get on Shark Tank? Did you just apply and they just kind of, you know, picked out we, some? Or We got an email from the producer. So they said, hey, we'd like to, you know, uh, to tell you about Shark Tank and see if you'd want to be on the show. So, uh, oh, so they, they sought pro- you out. Okay. They did, yeah. But um, they said they don't do that for very many, mm-hmm. you know, companies and that most people go through a, Pretty standard, like uh, application tryout interview process or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I think it might have been like our Kickstarter project or our exposure from uh, the Shopify competition that we were part of that yeah. got us noticed by the producers. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you ended up with a deal on Shark Tank. Uh, what kind of deal did you end up with there? Because it was it's kind of unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we ended up with a deal uh, that was. Uh, some capitals, uh, $150,000 in exchange for a royalty um, on uh, a big royalty until the sharks got their money back and then a small royalty thereafter in exchange for their expertise. Yeah. Um, and how many yeah, sharks so actually deal. were in on that deal? That's the interesting part, I think. <laughs> Everybody but Mark Cuban was in on that deal. <laughs> yeah. And Cuban did counter with an offer for two hundred fifty thousand dollars in exchange for some percentage. I forget what it was exactly. Uh huh. Yeah. So I mean, I think it's wise you end up going with the four sharks instead of one because you know partnerships distribution is way more important than just one big name. Um, uh, what, go ahead. Me? Maybe. So, okay. Um, All right. So tell me more. Why do you say maybe? Well, I mean, um, I can say that uh, our our emphasis with respect to Shark Tank when we decided to do this project. It wasn't like when we got the, the you know, phone call, it wasn't like, oh, totally, we'll definitely spend all this time working on Shark Tank because Dave and I have other things to do during the day and we didn't need you know, a lot of this time being sucked up by Shark Tank if we weren't going to definitely get on the show and have a good have a good uh, exposure to it. And what mm-hmm. we found out is not everybody that goes through all the process gets on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, it, could, it, could, it could turn out to be a colossal waste of time. Yeah. Um, thankfully, it didn't didn't end up that way. But uh, basically, what I'm getting at is, we were more interested in being on the show, uh, yeah. and saying, you know, if something great comes out of the investment, if, if a good opportunity comes out, that's that's bonus material. Like we'll totally take a good deal if it's offered to us. But you know, what's within our control is making a great episode, and getting on the show, and yeah. getting all these people to hear what coffee are. Totally. So. Uh, that being said, uh, we haven't closed up any deals with any sharks that we made on the show. We're, okay. It's not out of the question that we could do that, but we haven't. We're not working directly with any of the people that are on the show. Gotcha. So you did take their investment money, or you did not? We did not take. Okay. We did not. No. Gotcha. So Actually. as of right now, Shark Tank just became an extended commercial for Coffee Julie's, right? Well, yeah, more or less, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, which is still good. I mean, I watch the show all the time, and often when I see entrepreneurs playing hardball, uh, you know, sometimes I think, why are they doing that? And then sometimes I think, they're genius. Like, they're just getting a long commercial. It doesn't even matter if they get a deal. They're on, you know, national television. The exposure from Shark Tank is a lot. I mean, uh, the ratings, you can look it up on Wikipedia, but like six million for the for the first airing, and then, you know, there's reruns and other stuff, and you get to be on the ABC website that sends you a lot of traffic and all that stuff. So yeah. it's really a great opportunity for anybody, um, as long as you understand, you know, where the where the value is that the that the show brings to your company. Absolutely. It's very 
could, you could wind up with a great deal mm-hmm. that, that with a great uh, investor from that show that you know works for you. Um, but you know, putting that as the only the only thing that's of value is mm-hmm. is leaving it out. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so what kind of growth have you experienced since being on Shark Tank? Because like you said, it is a lot of exposure. You're on national television. You're kind of all over the internet instantly. Um, you know, how many, you know, units sold? I mean, what did it do? I mean, whatever you can divulge for us. Actually, I mean, we usually don't talk about that a lot, but I was just, you know, posting on Facebook about it yesterday. So we were on, um, back order mm-hmm. from, we, we had a piece amount of units in stock and, um, within a few days, we sold through those. The response was way more than we thought it was going to be. A hundred thousand uni kits in in, in um, like two days. Wow. To our website. So um, we sold through all of our existing inventory. We went on back order, uh, and we were collecting email addresses so that we could, you know, let people know we were off back order. But people are still we're still allowed to order the product. Yeah. So um, you know, the back order grew, and as the arms are our manufacturing caught up with the, with the list and we shrunk it down and down and down but it, it wasn't until about last week that we went off that order God. and uh, the entire the total number of orders between that time was like I think 5,600 so I can so say how many, how many was it again? 600 5,600 yeah units from you know January till now that you kind of sold 5,600 orders 5,600 yeah. orders yeah perfect um so let me ask you this, you know, you've been on Kickstarter and you've, you know, raised money, which essentially was selling your product, you know, before you had one. And then you've also been on Shark Tank. How did they compare in terms of how much they allowed your business to grow? Um, so the, one of the things that we picked up between, you know, Kickstarter was like this entire, this type of project all by itself. It was we sold all these things we didn't have and then we had to basically take that lump of money and figure out how to not spend it all and get the people what they deserve and then when we're done with it, we're trying to start a business out of mm-hmm. it that has sales every month and has you know, income and all this stuff. So they're 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 different. And what we learned um, in the year after a year and a half after um, Kickstarter uh, leading up Shark Tank is we do the best uh, bang for a buck with direct email marketing. So we don't send very many emails uh, per year, but those are kind of we send emails during the holidays and say, say, hey, you know, if you bought, bought Julie's before, they make a great gift. You should buy for somebody you know. Or if you're on email list and you don't have them yet, here's a, you know, Julie's on sale this holiday season. We'll pick up the set or whatever. Yeah. So we look around a lot for how to get new email addresses because they turn out to be very valuable to us. So one of the things that we got out of uh, Shark Tank was a ton of email addresses. Okay. In addition to just, um, addition to just getting the sales and people going away, we captured about 40,000 email addresses. Yeah. So those are going to be you know, valuable to us if people didn't feel like buying now, they might feel like buying later, they might, you know, think of us during the holidays and get a good gift for their friends or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that was the main difference. We didn't, we got our backers from Kickstarter, which which a lot of them still, you know, follow us and, and buy product and give us gifts, but that's small in comparison to the number we were able to capture for, for Shark Tank. So I think yeah. that's going to work. Much, much better for us. Yeah, so when it comes down to it, emails are really important to you guys, and you got more emails from Shark Tank than Kickstarter, and it's just that simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. it makes sense. It was actually it was actually similar uh, time scale, similar amount of sales, um, two you know, kind of similar experiences. We were just a little bit more prepared this time around. Like, yeah, Shark, like the company's Shark, more mature and ready to handle it, yeah. Shark Tank exceeded our expect- expectations. I just emailed the fact was, hey, can you, can you call a lot more of these now? Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. No, that's great. Now, you also have a, a really high-profile advisor, Tim Ferriss. Um, and actually, wasn't it Tim that you called during the Shark Tank episode? Call yeah. Tim. Yeah, I thought that was a good move. I mean, it's like, hey, what a great negotiating tactic. Hold on, let me go talk, call Tim Ferriss, and then I'll come back and talk to you. <laughs> so that's yeah. kind of genius. Yeah, so uh, I was kind of um, – I was surprised that ABC didn't uh, highlight that more, but they mm-hmm. – only flashed Tim's name up there for like five seconds. So, um, 
lot of people miss that, but uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool, um, and, and he gave us some good advice on the show. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. How do you end up with such a high-profile advisor? I mean, you know, do you just know him from something else? I mean, do you, do you know a guy that knows a guy? <laughs> like, how did you end up with him? Uh, so we use a website. Um, our, our store is hosted on Shopify.com. Mm-hmm. So that's our, our e-commerce back end. Okay. And they host a business competition every year called Build a Business Competition. And um, in 2011, when we finished Kickstarter, we launched our store on Shopify. Mm-hmm. And we won the 2011 Shopify Build a Business Competition. And that was sponsored by Tim Ferriss and a few other, other people. Uh, so. Okay. To have dinner with him first, that was like the prize. Uh-huh. So we didn't actually know him beforehand. Um, I actually didn't know him yet. I talked to him on the phone a few times. And, uh, you know, we do shooting questions every now and then. And when, we're, when we have big things going on with our business, like being on television, we call him up and, and, and use him because uh, he's a great resource. But that's how we got him. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, let me ask you this. Um, you know, does having a guy like Tim Ferriss around, does it actually help you when you get advice from him? Or is it more just a PR thing? Like, oh, I called Tim Ferriss. Like, does, does it really help your bottom line? Uh, I mean, it's definitely not a stunt. You know, mm-hmm. some uh, who's got that much experience as, uh, as an advisor, someone will call and get advice from. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a lot of valuable stuff to tell us uh, you know, around the time that we won the competition that helped us kind of focus on what we needed to do. Yeah. Um, but, also, I've not in like deal communication with the guy or anything like that. So, um, you know, it, it definitely you know, helped out. I mean, it, was, it was really great around the time of competition. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, what's the best advice he's ever given you? Because he's kind of a marketing mastermind. I mean, he goes from nothing to you know all these New York Times bestsellers and all this stuff. Um, what's the best advice he's given you guys about marketing or anything really? Uh, I think that probably the best advice he he'd given us is. You know, before I ever met him, was his was his first book. Um, <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> it was kind of like around the same time that we, Dave and I were both thinking about how to um, how to get out of our daytime jobs and how to progress on our on our little side business. And a lot of the tips in that first book are still really great ones. So um, that's kind of where I think that he. He helped us out with the most. Yeah, he's so transparent. We all have access to him, really. <laughs> you know, he's not really holding anything back in his books. If anything, he tells you too much. Yeah, for sure. And um, there were other people who were um, winners of the 2011 Google Business Competition, and one of them, um, a company called Flockstocks, it was a girl from Australia who I you know, sat down and had dinner with her, talked to her. She said, "I got a copy of Tim's book, mm-hmm. and I followed the letter, mm-hmm. and I." put my shop on Shopify and she won, you know, she did a, a large amount of business and she was doing interviews from uh, a villa in Thailand while pe- other people ran her business for her at home in Australia. So, you know, <laughs> so I- <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely. I've uh, listened to the audio version of that book countless times. I don't even know anymore. Um, so we talked about uh, Kickstarter. We talked about Shark Tank. Um, and those are not ongoing events. Those are very much like one-time things. There's a blast. You get a lot of PR. You get a lot of email addresses. But then at some point, we all see this, you know, um, the curve drops off. You know, the bump mm-hmm. from Kickstarter, the bump from Shark Tank, they don't last in a year or two. I mean, they, you know, that's normal. It's nothing, you know, uh, wrong with that. Um, so what are you guys doing on an ongoing basis to acquire new customers? I know you mentioned emails are really important to you. Is there anything else in terms of channels for growth that you guys focus on? Are you taking out ads anywhere? Do you do social media marketing? I mean, do you do anything else at all? Or are you still just kind of running off of what's happened with Kickstarter and Shark Tank? Uh, well, so we can identify the the bumps in traffic that come from our, our media events and all of those have so far have been free. So you're right. Those were kind of like one time things that aren't going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, our, our email list is, we keep that from, you know, going forward and we can use that as a tool to find uh, more email addresses to add to it. So for instance, we're um, looking at different companies that we can uh, partner with in order to offer, for uh, you know, cool things to our customers in exchange for you know getting some exposure on someone else's email list um, okay. by doing kind of a double opt-in feature. So if we say, hey, we have you know this big email list, Not bad. Well, like and they have another list of some size. If we give shout a mention to your product and give a link to your product in our email, and you do the same for us, okay. especially if it's something you know relevant, 
we need drink and coffee all the time because we're coffee proud. I really, really like this company that makes that curates coffee and says we're the best coffee for month. I think that everybody on my email list should definitely hear about it. I don't think spam me about it without sending it to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can kind of cross pollinate our lists. Yeah. So we can bottle the size and those turn out to be valuable for me and then and now I have an even bigger list that I can go and find other people who are willing to work with me to, to do the same thing over and over, and over again. So um, that's one thing that we um, that we're doing to to continue our growth and to have the those big gifts that we give to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as like advertising, marketing, Facebook, social media, that kind of stuff, we suck at that. Like we <laughs> No thanks for the honesty, that's great. <laughs> Terrible at that. We um, we were definitely a little bit spoiled on on the, on the Kickstarter and all the free media and attention that we've gotten, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, it, it did give us kind of a new perspective that when we sat back and we, we got all that for free, so we've never spent you know very much money on advertising or paper or anything at all. Yeah. Um, we get to find out you know, where is the free stuff or the really really cheap stuff that that actually works. So email is totally. You know, we pay for our Mad Media subscription, and that's it. But um, so we're trying to get good at that because if we get good at that, it's still free. You know, that's 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 the best case scenario. Um, and uh, you know, stuff like that. So um, that's kind of where we're focusing on, and that's kind of we were able to identify that by by having that opportunity of a lot of free press. Yeah, you know, what you're saying is kind of typical for people that come on the show. Um, Most companies are not good at every kind of customer acquisition strategy, but they're really good at one of them. Um, So we'll have one company on, they know everything about viral videos, but they would never, Mm -hmm. you know, do Google ads or they would never do something else. And, you know, you have somebody else like you, you've learned how to, you know, utilize email list and free publicity through Kickstarter, Shark Tank, things like that. Um, So I think it makes sense. And that might be the one takeaway that our audience uh, can really gravitate toward with this episode is how you cross pollinate email list. Um, I think that's a genius tactic because email lists are so effective. If you have somebody with a similar product and you can give a shout out to them, they can give a shout out to you. Nobody pays for advertising. And all of a sudden you have a really high percentage of people that convert over and get on your list and buy your products. Um, So thanks for sharing that because I think think that's just awesome insight. Um, And uh, I I think it's going to work for a long time. I mean, it's not like that's a one hit thing because you can keep finding people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a great interview. Let me ask you uh, one last question here. What's the best advice that you have for anyone that's trying to grow their customer base? Um, and it may be a tactic or it may just be a mindset. What's the best advice you have for them? Um, I, yeah, I don't want to be repetitive, but don't underestimate the value of email, direct email marketing. Um, and also, kind of along the same lines, communication with your uh, with your customer like uh, in the most transparent way you can. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they finally incorporate their startup and they get into their office and they think, okay, we've got to just pretend that we're this big company and stuff. Mm-hmm. But people love to hear about like the actual, you know, the actual human beings that are behind this, um, this company. And that's kind of like, I think that's a lot of reason why Kickstarter you know, works really well because you feel like you're a part of something. You're feeling like you're right um, alongside the entrepreneur who's making the product instead of just buying something cool and showing it to your friends. You're like you're you're, you're part of the behind the scenes look. So um, email marketing can help you do that uh, because it's a good way to communicate with your customers and a good way to keep the um, social media and stuff can be great for that too. But uh, emails you can kind of track and understand better and if you're trying to sell something um you know email is the best way to get people right onto your site and into into the shopping cart yeah that's great uh dave thank you so much for coming on growth hacker tv and thanks for being so transparent about uh everything you guys have done no problem